so but but you know why are as so many people doing this coral gardening um the direct transplantation the coral fragmenting you know and it's it's basically it's the idea that we're trying to restore the reef to what it used to be so it's basically going in and saying well there used to be lots of acropora corals here now they're not doing well so let's fragment the acropora corals let's reproduce them asexually and let's fill this place back up with acroporas so it's focusing on stability or returning the environment to what it used to be which you know as we talked about the, the environment's changing you know with climate change um you can't really restore it to what it used to be um because there it's not it's, it's not the same the water is not the same the temperature is not the same all these things um so this is this is basically assuming that the ecosystem is a stable state that what was there 20 years ago is what's going to be there 20 years ahead um and so we do fragmentation um, nursery rearing and then transplantation, asexual propagation. So we're using that asexual reproductive mode that we saw was, you know, mostly for small scale disturbances in the natural. Um, it's how corals recover from partial mortality, how they grow and expand their colony size. Um, it's, it's well established and it comes from the aquarium trade. And for the aquarium trade, I think it's really great. You know, if you can take a coral from the ocean, usually you have to take lots of corals from the ocean and you get one that, you know, is genetically quite strong and it um, survives well in the aquarium, even if you're lazy and you don't, you know, keep perfect temperatures and nutrient levels and, and you're not watching your aquarium closely. You find one coral that can grow well in there. Yeah, by all means, asexual fragment that thing and sell it to everyone. You know, keep that genetic thing. It's it's in an artificial environment. Um, just keep reproducing it through asexual fragmentation, so you don't have to go back to the ocean and steal more corals. So this evolved in like the 1970s, 1980s from the aquarium trade, and then people started saying, "Well, why don't we do this in the real environment? I mean, why aren't we out doing this on coral reefs? Coral reefs are going away. We can asexually fragment these corals and grow them out. Why aren't we doing that?" Um, and so that's where it came from. And it can be beneficial. You know, you can increase the number of corals. I mean, you can literally go in, start with 100 donor corals and create 100,000 daughter colonies. And you can say, you know, I increased the coral abundance in this area. So in that terms, it is successful and it's easy. Um, you know, you can use this, you can do this with kids. I have this photo here. Um, this girl is like 14. Um, we do this with the school kids on a very regular basis. It's a great way to encourage participation by the local community, to get people involved, to get people doing actions, education, awareness. It's, it's great for all that. Um, and so I'm not like, you know, completely putting it down or saying nobody should be doing asexual propagation. However, it might be not the silver bullet that many groups think and it shouldn't maybe be the one that we rely upon the most. And here's why. So what's going on in, in most, we saw that, you know, that what it was at 48 plus 20. So like almost 70% of the restoration projects in the world are using asexual methods. So what they're doing, what the mainstream coral propagation procedure is, is you go and you find a nice healthy coral. And you assume, well, this coral is healthy, so it must be strong, you know, like if it's survived bleaching events, it's survived the, the problems that we've had on our reefs, this coral must be strong. So I want its DNA to be more abundant in the ecosystem and in, in the population of corals. So you go and because it's a colonial colony of this coral, you can go and you can just knock off these branches or you can cut it with a bandsaw and, and every polyp has the potential to grow a new colony. So you cut this up into tons of little pieces, you throw it on your nursery, and every single one of these pieces, we saw in that graph, it was like 79% survival, will become an adult colony. So this looks great on Instagram. This looks great if you're getting funding from groups that don't really know about corals. Um, you know, you get funding from PetSmart or a hotel chain. And you're like, look, I, I'll, you give me this money 
and I'll create 100,000 corals for you. And, and you can do that. You can create 100,000 corals and you can, you can fulfill your, your, the people who gave you money, you can fulfill their requirements and their goals and you can get money the next year. Um, and so this is why this is going on. But I would argue that this is kind of um, a, a good thing that's been used too much. This is applicable in some ways. There are reasons to do this. Because like I said, in the aquarium trade, 100%. When it's done naturally, like if you get a boat that comes, a, a, a boat comes in and drops an anchor and it breaks all the corals on the reef and you put them on your nursery and grow them up, great. I think that's wonderful. You're, you're preserving the biodiversity in your area. What you're not doing is increasing the biodiversity. You're not increasing the species level diversity and you're not increasing the individual, the genetic diversity of the reef. You're taking corals that have grown in the past and you're predicting that they're gonna be suitable for whatever happens in the future. And what we're seeing around the world is this is not usually the case. You know, if it, I am really against this method being used on large scales. If you wanna know more about it, um, you can check on our website, my article, Coral Fragging Should Be Banned. And in, I'm sorry, it's kind of a clickbait title. Um, I don't mean banned completely, but you know, gets the discussion going. Um, but basically we go through about, you know, founder effects, genetic bottlenecking, inbreeding, outbreeding depressions, and those kinds of events that, that go along with this type of behavior. Um, so, so we do see that there is applications for this, but this is not something that should be the only way. There's no group in the world that's going to use just this method and be successful at restoring their reefs. So, um, you know, that, that, that's quite obvious at this point, but 70% of the groups out there are still relying on it. So let's talk about some of the limits. Um, you know, it requires a donor reef. So you have to have a reef of high relative health. You're taking from the healthy reef. Um, you're taking a coral that's doing well and you're moving it to somewhere where other corals have not done well. Um, and so the long-term project, you know, trajectory on that is not very good. Um, these tend to be very small scale or have high costs. If we look through the literature, they may have negative effects on those, those donor reefs or, or even the surrounding areas um, because they have low genetic and species diversity. The colony size is the uniform. You know, it, it, these are other issues that we don't really foresee um, when, we're, when we're doing these restoration activities sometimes or, or have done in the past. But the biggest thing, the thing that, you know, concerns me the most is that these asexually produced or monospecific reefs, they're done reproducing. So if you go and, and you get this grant and to create 100,000 coral colonies, somewhere and um, you do that and you create this now mo what's called a monospecific area right every even though you have a hundred thousand cor coral colonies they all came from the same donor colonies they cannot reproduce because remember a coral we talked earlier we said a coral that reproduce that spawns cannot self-fertilize so the eggs and sperm from one genetic individual cannot fertilize itself there's a barrier towards that. It has to fertilize with another individual, genetic individual. So you've just created a sterile reef. Even though you look like you have 100,000 corals there, it's never gonna, there's never gonna be a second generation. That, that reef is not seeding other reefs with larvae. Um, and this photo just shows, this was early on, we were doing a lot of this asexual um, propagation. And in 2010, our nurseries all died um, because if your coral didn't, wasn't going to survive that bleaching and you use that coral to fill up your nurseries, everything's dead. Um, so, so we got kind of a crash course in this back then. When we talk about adaptability or, or the survival, the long-term survival of ecosystems, it takes genetic diversity. You know, when we have the stable state where the ecosystem is, is you know, in, in kind of this stasis where, where things aren't changing too radically, then we can get, you know, a, a lot of the same looking corals growing, but they're going to be different 
genetic individuals. That's why I've colored them different. And it's just to show each different color is a different genetic individual, even though they're all the same species. If we get like a warming event, some individuals are gonna be more or less prone to that, to, to succumbing to that, or more or less able to handle it, just like us. Um, you, you know, you can look at COVID, for example, that's a very relevant uh, example right now. Some people are asymptomatic and, and don't even know they have it, and others have to be intubated. Um, and so that's the same with corals. We're all the same species, but we have different reactions because we have different genetics. And so if we have a nice diverse system and we have some disturbance, some corals are gonna die and some are gonna survive to reproduce both asexually and sexually. If we have this monospecific reef where we've created from fragments cloning all these different corals, yeah, it looks like an abundant reef, but when we get a disturbance that that particular genetic material can't deal with, the entire reef goes away. So, Short term, this might look good, but long term, it never looks good. So why are people still doing it? Well, in that paper by um, Bostrom Einerson um, and some of our colleagues as well um, that came out in 2020, they made a database of all of the coral restoration programs that are publishing. What they found was 60% of projects don't take data for, for more than 18 months. 18 months is like the longest people take data. A lot of projects were taking data for less than a year. And you can, you can look up this. This is a, a public app. It's, um, you, can, you can download it for free, this paper and the database. Um, but most were, were, were not doing a year. So they're going and, and they're saying, hey, look, we create 100,000 fragments and we've transplanted in the reef. And after six months, they're all doing wonderful. And they go over to their funders and say, so can we have more money for next year? Um, and you know, how, how can you say that you've done anything good when you're working with corals and you only, you only, um, monitor them for less than two years, corals are slow growing organism. Anyone can get a coral to grow on a nursery. Like I said, I do this with school kids. Um, anyone can grow corals when conditions are nice. You look at this tunnel here. Um, this tunnel was, this is an anchor drag area. So a boat dragged an anchor down here. You can see this nice reef and then the reef's just destroyed. So we put down this tunnel and we took all the broken corals, and put them on here and they all did extremely well. You can see they, how much they grew. But this is during 2014, we had a bleaching event. Now these corals are not very genetically diverse because they were all fragments and about 60% of this structure died in 2014 after this photo. So if we were only monitoring this for the first three or four years, I think this was, we started this in 2011. If we had only been monitoring this for two years, we would have said we were incredibly successful. We had nearly hundred percent survival, incredible growth, incredible diversity, you know, uh, complexity of reef structure. This is a, this is hundred percent a success. One year later, <laughs> not so great. Right. So if you're only monitoring for 18 months, it's easy to show success. And so people are basically saying, look, six months later, this is doing great. We publish, we do the next project. We publish, we do the next project. And if we were doing long term monitoring, then we would see that maybe these aren't so great. The other issue that was identified is that most people are working just with Acropora coral. 30% of all the corals restored were Acropora corals. Now, this makes sense in Florida with like the Coral Restoration Foundation, the CRF, because they're working with a genre of corals that's nearly extinct in their area. Um, and so they are working just with Acropora corals and they've been doing this for nearly 20 years. And so many other groups see on social media, these pictures of Acropora corals being, being restored. And so they think that's the coral we need to work with. Um, it's also the fastest growing coral. So a lot of these people who are working with um, funding that need to have like these milestones where they're like, you know, in one year we'll produce this many corals and they will have extended their branches by this much. They're gonna work with these mass these branching corals. They don't wanna work with the massive varieties that grows half a centimeter a year. So we have, you know, a few problems. Just acropores are the fastest growing. They're the easiest to work with but they're also the fastest dying coral. They're the ones that are predicted to go ex extinct the fastest. 
And so they're the ones that are on the endangered species list. They're the ones that are having troubles with bleaching. They're fast growing corals that don't put much energy into reserves. And so when conditions are not good, they die. And so we do need them. They're great habitat for fishes and invertebrates, but they are not our reef building corals. So if we're doing reef restoration, if we're doing ecosystem restoration, we need to be focusing on all of these other ones that people are not focusing on. So that's just my little spiel about what's wrong in the world of coral restoration at the moment. So how can we try to fix that? We need to switch to a focus on genetic diversity, not just coral abundance, not just getting lots of Acropora branching corals growing so that we can show nice pictures on, on social media and get funding for the next cycle. What we need to be thinking about is that genetic diversity is the key to survival and adaptability. So cloning, we can look on land. We know that cloning and monoculture leads to pests, disease, and mass mortality events. We can look at pretty much any food that we eat, that we mass produce and factory farm. These issues of pests and disease are, are extremely um, salient issues. So if we're working with coral reefs and we're using cloning and monoculture, and we're working in areas that are being succumbing to disease, then we're not really helping. So we need to start thinking about adaptation and evolution. And adaptation and evolution occur through att attrition and mutation, basically throwing tons of, of genetic material out there. Most of it won't survive, but some of it will. And that which does survive will be passing on their genetic material to the next generation. And that generation will be further adapted to, to that, that ecosystem or those changing conditions. And the way that we can do this is by making corals, these long lived, slow reproducing organisms, more like say the reproductive mode of bacteria. Bacteria, as we know, have very fast generation times or to bring in COVID again, that viruses. They have very fast generation times and very high adaptation rates. We've got several new strains of COVID um, just in the last year. Um, if it was a slow growing, slow reproducing organism like corals, we wouldn't have any new strains. Now we also can talk about hybridization. Hybridization, of course, is um, when two species combine. And we're used to thinking about things like lions and tigers or horses and donkeys. And knowing that if we hybridize two of those types of species, that their offspring is generally sterile. However, we look at corals, the, the evolutionary history of corals, we find that hybridization is a very important factor. And you can look at um, some of the work from Betty Willis in the late 80s and early 90s. And she was doing these experiments and finding out that there was, she found more than like 43 different species that were actually hybrids. Um, and in the, in the Caribbean, for a very long period of time, they thought they had three species of Acropora, uh, three distinct species. Then they figured out that one of them was actually just a hybridized species of the other two. So because corals reproduce through these synchronous spawning events that we're almost getting to, um, then we can see that there's a high propensity for different species to interact during to fertilize, cross-fertilize. So ad hybridization is actually a big part of the coral evolutionary history, where it's not so much the, the mammals and other organisms that we're familiar with. Um, and so basically what it comes down to is that if we want corals to adapt to climate change, to the effects of humans, to all of these habitat destruction and, and changes in water quality that is part of the Anthropocene, um, then we need to have high genetic diversity, we need to have high reproductive success and increased generation times, basically. And uh, I include this photo just because you can see here, this is a structure, a mineral accretion device called HINFI. And um, we do not do any asexual propagation on here. We use only corals of opportunity or unsecured recruits, corals that would die otherwise if we did nothing. And we move them on to this. And what you can see is that these acropores here at the top, they're dead now. 
Um, they didn't survive this. They bleached and died. But because we were working with so many species, we came out of 2014 with very low mortality. I think it was about under, it was under 5% um, because of our high diversity genetic and species diversity on this structure. Unlike the structure that I showed you in the last picture, it had like 60% mortality in the same year. 